So we're going to get started. Hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aisha Bell Hardaway. I am a clinical professor here um, in the Milton Kramer Law Clinic. And I am going to moderate, to the extent that this um, exercise needs to be moderated, uh, what is the first of two Zaremski lectures this semester. The Zaremski lectures are generously supported by Mal Zaremski, a graduate and uh, a donor of our law school. Um, and so today you all have come here to hear about Hobby Lobby uh, and what it means. So um, we have three of our esteemed faculty members who have agreed so generously uh, to be a part of this discussion. They will speak uh, for some time and then once they're done we will open it up for questions. So to the extent that you have them there will be an opportunity for that. Um, so I'll, I'll do the introductions. Professor Jesse Hill is the Associate Dean of Faculty, uh, for Faculty Development and Research and the Laura B. Chisholm Distinguished Research Scholar. Uh, her teaching here at the law school focuses on constitutional law, federal civil procedure, civil rights, reproductive rights, and law and religion. Uh, we also have Jonathan Adler, who is the inaugural Johann Bear High uh, Memorial Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Business law and regulation here at Cases Law School, where he teaches courses in constitutional, environmental, and administrative law. Uh, um, last but not least, certainly, is Dean Enton. He's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the David L. Brennan Professor of Law. Prior to joining the law faculty here at Case, he clerked for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was on uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals. During his long tenure here at the law school, Dean Enton has taught constitutional law, administrative law, courts, public policy, and social change, as well as a seminar on the Supreme Court. Uh, so welcome to our panel. They'll speak for some time. We're going to go in alphabetical order, just so you know. And so that means that Professor Adler is up first. All right. Uh, good, uh, good midday, I guess, or good day. I um, want to say a little bit about um, this case and what it means and what we know, and I'm going to try and be brief so that we leave lots of time for questions and, and discussion. Um, so in the cases of, of Hobby Lobby versus Burwell and, and Conestoga Wood versus Burwell, uh, it's important just to understand some things coming in. We usually talk about cases involving the free exercise of religion as constitutional cases. Um, this, however, was not a constitutional case. It was a statutory case, and I think that matters quite significantly both in terms of what we think of, of the decision and also what its long-term uh, legal implications are. The case was brought, or the cases that reached the Supreme Court uh, concerned the application of something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, something that had been uh, enacted in the 1990s um, unanimously in the House uh, by a vote of 96 to 3 in the Senate and signed into law uh, by President Bill Clinton. Um, the three senators who voted against it um, were Robert Byrd, Jesse Helms, and I'm going to forget the third. Um, the law was a response to a Supreme Court decision called Employment Division versus Smith, uh, which had, I think it's fair to say, narrowed the scope of free exercise protection under the First Amendment to hold that a generally applicable law that was not targeted against religion or motivated by some form of religious animus uh, did not need to contain an exception for uh, religious objectors. In this particular case, an individual was unable to uh, obtain unemployment benefits because uh, he had lost his job uh, due to the use of uh, peyote, and his claim was that peyote, he needed to use peyote as part of his religion, and he'd been denied unemployment benefits because typically, he, uh, at least in, in Oregon, you couldn't get them if you had been fired for uh, something like illegal drug use. And the Supreme Court said, you know, this is across the board. Uh, rule against or, or drugs or punishment or, or consequence of using drugs. Um, there's no need to offer a religious exception. Um, Congress uh, and the Clinton administration thought that was unduly restrictive, uh, was a, arguably a revision of what the case law had been up until that point. No one's denying that scope, and so RIFRA uh, was enacted. And RIFRA said that uh, for, um, uh, it was purported to apply to both federal and state law. It, it now only applies to federal law that um, any uh, law that infringes upon the free exercise must be justified by a compelling interest and that um, it must be the least restrictive way of achieving the stated government's interest. 
uh, and arguably not only restored pre-Smith jurisprudence, but arguably uh, goes beyond that, at least in terms of, of the language of the decision. So that's important because uh, insofar as we like or don't like the result in, in the Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood cases, it's something that Congress is free to revise. Uh, I think under Smith, the, the constitutional claim made by the Greens, who are the owners of Hobby Lobby, even the constitutional claim made by groups like Little Sisters of the Poor, at least under current doctrine, is quite weak. Uh, that is to say, it'd be really hard to argue that under Smith, there is a constitutional right to refuse to participate uh, in something like uh, the contraception mandate, even if uh, the government is engaging in uh, selectively exempting some from, from those requirements. Uh, the second thing to note about this case is that it's not the result of a, uh, this was not a congressional decision to expressly require contraception coverage uh, under uh, the Affordable Care Act. It was rather a deci the decision of what would be covered as preventative care that had to be offered by group insurance plans without, co without cost sharing, that is without a copay by the insured individual, was something that was delegated to the Department of Health and Human Services, and the, the Department of Health and Human Services was authorized to make that decision in, in consultation with the Institute of Medicine. It was, so it was an administrative decision, it was a regulation made by the agency that said, okay, we are going to define preventative services to include all forms of FDA-approved contraception. And then the Department of Health and Human Services said at the time of issuing this that we will provide a exemption for some religious groups, houses of worship and their auxiliaries, um, but not um, uh, 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 to others that may have religious objection. And then that's important as well because Congress could have in the Affordable Care Act said RIFRA doesn't apply. Congress could have presented the court with a more difficult question by creating an express statutory mandate in the law that arguably conflicted with RIFRA, but Congress didn't do either of those things. It rather delegated uh, this authority to the agency. And uh, one thing that RIFRA clearly, do, clearly does is it applies to all uh, agency actions. And indeed, by its terms, it's supposed to apply to all federal law, even subsequently enacted laws that don't expressly exempt uh, RIFRA. So, um, it's clear that RIFRA applied. It's clear that RIFRA was meant to provide significantly greater protection to free exercise than the Supreme Court had said in Employment Division versus Smith uh, should apply. So what then were the questions for the court? Well, one was, does it apply here? Because Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood and lots of others who have filed objections to uh, the, the contraception coverage mandate uh, are for-profit entities. So there's one question is, well, can, it, can a for-profit entity or, or can a corporation generally uh, seek the protection of RIFRA. Secondly, then, if, if so, is ensuring cost for your uh, contraception coverage or contraception coverage without cost sharing a compelling government compelling governmental interest? And then, uh, if so, is this the least restrictive way of ensuring that, that end? On the first question, the court split five to two, um, saying that, yes, corporations are covered by RIFRA. The primary basis for that uh, is uh, something called the Dictionary Act. Congress passed a law way back when saying that for purposes of federal law, um, corporations are to be treated as persons. This is why all sorts of various laws um, that make it illegal for persons to do things also apply to corporations as entities. Um, again, Congress free to revise that, um, uh, has, has not done so. Uh, secondly, there are cases, uh, pre-employment division versus Smith cases in which corporate entities raised free exercise claims they lost those claims, but what's important for this initial threshold question is the court heard the claims. That is, in these prior cases, the court did not say, sorry, you're a corporation, or sorry, uh, you're engaged in commercial or for-profit or, or profit-seeking activity, you can't raise the claim. The court said, and sa said instead, we'll hear your claim, and we'll apply the test, and you'll lose. And again, you know, legally, we have to think about these questions. Uh, separately, the other thing that's just interesting about, about this question, whether or not it applies to corporations, is the author of the primary dissent, uh, Justice Ginsburg, has since the Hobby Lobby decision in an interview said that this was not a particularly important issue for her dissent, and that her real view is that any individual or any employer engaged in uh, a profit-making activity, whether a corporation or a sole proprietor, um, uh, should not be able to make uh, the sort of claim uh, that was at issue here. Um, on the issue of compelling interest, the, majority, the court assumed that um, access to uh, co uh, contraception coverage without cost sharing uh, is a compelling interest and focused on the least restrictive uh, alternative. And the, and the problem here, I have one minute left, I'm going to be super quick. Oh. I'm going to interrupt you for an announcement. Uh -oh. Sorry. We have an overflow room now, room A63. 
55 with seats, and there's a video of the panel. So um, please move over there if you don't have a seat. And I think we have a safety issue also with blocking the stairs, so it would be really good if people went to the overflow room if they don't have a seat. And we'll be able to get questions from the overflow room? Um, will we get questions from the overflow Questions. Yeah, somebody, we and, there's, and there's another seat. There's, there are a couple open seats. There was one okay. here, and there's another seat over here. If you have a question, come back and we'll take your question. Okay, so really, really quickly, so um, we have lots of time for, for questions and for my, my uh, co-panelists. Um, the, the least restrictive alternative um, argument was made more difficult in part because um, as, both initially as, as issued the, the contraception coverage requirement and then as modified in response to uh, concerns that were raised. Um, by various religious groups exempts some of those organizations. And so the, the, the question that, the gov that at least the majority thought the government had to answer but didn't was um, if you're willing to exempt the church, why can't you exempt, why don't you also exempt an entity that has a, a religious purpose or that it has a, as equal a sincere religious belief? Um, because once you provide an exemption to one, it's hard to argue that, they're, that, that you're not capable of providing an exemption to another. It was also uh, or accepted, or, or I guess conceded by the government, and, and this is an interesting concession because empirically, I'm not sure it's true, but the government at least did claim that the accommodation it was making for, to, uh, for, for um, some religious institutions would not result in the, in, in the loss of uh, contraception coverage. It would just relieve the employer of actually having to provide for it. Now, there's some dispute about how the government's actually going to fulfill that, that claim, but they did concede that. And, and legally, that's important because the argument might have been a little different if the government had come in and said, um, we're not imposing this requirement at all on certain religious institutions. We don't think Hobby Lobby counts. Uh, even though their bylaws talk about their religious purpose, even though every, all the corporate documents talk about how they want to uh, engage in their business in conformance with, with the principles of Christ and so on and so forth, and they close on Sundays, and the only religious things they carry are Christmas things and so on. Uh, I mean, there's no dispute that Hobby Lobby is, is, is owned by, by folks that seek to run that business in accord with uh, what they believe their religious uh, 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 commitments require. It would have been a different case had the government said, everyone we exempt mean uh, it, it, we, we prevent their employees will not be able to get uh, contraception coverage without cost sharing. The government didn't claim that, and maybe they should have, uh, but they didn't. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that was really one reason why it was relatively easy for the majority of the court to say, it's hard, if, if you accept that these folks are religiously motivated, and we accept that the decision to engage in for-profit activity doesn't automatically exempt you from protection of RIFRA, it's hard for us to understand why you can exempt this group of people and not this other group of people. Um, and, and this is a common uh, issue that comes up in these sorts of claims. There's a case the Supreme Court will hear this coming term in, in the prison context, which involves a similar claim. Uh, a Muslim prisoner says um, that he is required to have a beard. The prison says we can't have beards because of safety reasons, because you might hide stuff in it or something. Um, that is their claim. Uh, he says, well, just let me have a half inch beard because that's what you let people that have health conditions that can't shave do. You let them have a half inch beard, let me have one as well. And I would think the government's gonna lose there because again, under this sort of analysis, it's, it's once you're applying this kind of heightened scrutiny, it's difficult for the government to argue we can exempt some but not others. Um, going forward, a couple things that, that we're still dealing with. Um, the court held that this is not the least restrictive alternative because the government's been offering accommodations to other employers. There's still the question of whether or not that accommodation is itself compliant with RIFRA. We don't know. There, as of two weeks ago, there were still 100 cases uh, pending in federal court, um, all by nonprofit entities that were granted the initial accommodation that claim the accommodation is insufficient. Um, and we, that will be, be interesting to see how that plays out. The, the reasons they claim the accommodation is insufficient to those who do not share the, the religious beliefs in question sound trivial has to do with what the form says that they have to sign and who they give it to and what the legal effect of the form is. Um, but for RIFRA purposes, that's irrelevant, right? If, if a law were burdening, if, if, if someone, if a Catholic came into court saying this law burdens my ability to engage in communion, the government can't argue, well, transubstantiation isn't real, therefore it doesn't matter, right? You have to assume that the religious belief that's the basis of the claim 
is 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 uh, is is uh, genuine unless there's some reason to believe that the person's lying, right? You, the, the fact that the religious belief seems trivial or odd doesn't matter, and in fact, that's part of the whole point of RIFRA, right? I mean, the point is to protect people that have religious beliefs that the majority might think are odd or strange or unsettling or whatever. Um, but there are, these cases are still bouncing around. Um, the other thing that's just interesting to note is, well, again, this, is, this, this concession by the government, the government's claim that it can offer the accommodation in a way that ensures that all employees of um, accommodated employers will still get uh, contraception coverage without, um, without cost sharing. Um, so what that means is that the actual effect of this decision on actual coverage of contraception should be minimal. Um, uh, the, the other thing that's worth noting is that um, if we just want to talk in general about access to either to contraception coverage or to contraception generally, I think it is indisputable that access to both is significantly greater today after the Hobby Lobby decision, even if we assume all the folks that are still challenging the accommodation win, is still greater than it was, say, five years ago. Uh, that's true if you look at, for example, the range of coverage of, of various forms of contraception under group plans and the trends that we've seen. Far more group plans cover uh, contraception, and that plan that that trend was 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 in place before passage of the Affordable Care Act. Also, access to contraception itself, which is not the same thing, uh, is also greater, uh, um, in, in both because there are more methods, but also because some are now available over the counter uh, that weren't available over the counter before. And that last point is just important because um, we know when health and care generally that ensuring insurance coverage and ensuring access are not the same thing. So for example, a, a uh, working class single mother who has long hours, um, the fact that she doesn't have to pay a copay when she, she goes to get co oral contraception reduces one barrier, but if she can't take off work to see a doctor or doesn't have a doctor, a primary care doctor to see, or her insurance car plans network doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the cost, the lack of a copay is actually the less significant obstacle to actual to the actual um, uh, service in question, and that's just important to keep in mind that coverage and, and access aren't entirely the same thing. I went out longer than I expected. I will turn it over to Dean Enton. Okay, um, thank you, John. Uh, I want to underscore uh, 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 Professor Adler's point that this is a statutory case, uh, not a constitutional case. Um, just to be clear, Employment Division against Smith says that, uh, in general, when government adopts a neutral law or rule of general applicability, it's going to be really, really hard, uh, if not impossible, for a free exercise claim to prevail. And the contraceptive mandate, uh, even though it's not explicitly in the Affordable Care Act, the contraceptive mandate uh, looks to be a neutral law of general applicability. And so either, either this would have been pretty much of a slam dunk for the government, or it would have been at least a much easier case if it had come up under the free exercise clause. Um, it is also perhaps worth noting that, um, no, that uh, as Professor Adler mentioned, um, the Supreme Court has held that RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, is unconstitutional as applied to state and local governments. It decided that back in 1997. The federal government has never raised the question about whether RIFRA might be unconstitutional as applied to the federal government. Um, whatever the likely merits of such an, an argument, I want to get into that here. I think the politics of making such an argument for any federal administration are such that, that we will never see that. Now, um, I want to um, uh, focus a little more on the actual opinion in, in Hobby Lobby. Um, because I think that, that part of what has generated much of the controversy here has to do with the cleverness with which the opinion, uh, the lead opinion, was written. Uh, again, as Professor Adler said, the court assumed that the government had a compelling interest in pr promoting uh, cost-free access to contraception um, and proceeded from that premise. The court did not explicitly hold that, that the government had such an interest, which at least leaves open the possibility that somebody down the road might come back and, and challenge that aspect 
uh, of the mandate under RFRA. Uh, now, uh, Justice Kennedy, who wrote a separate concurrence, actually does explicitly say that the government has a compelling interest. So this may be uh, kind of a law professor nose counting issue, but but at least uh, the lead opinion does not explicitly uh, hold. Um, moreover, the majority opinion does not uh, does not actually say that the lesser uh, the less burdensome alternatives are, in fact, consistent with the law. Again, it's something Professor Adler said. Um, now, one of the options that the court uh, mentioned was that the government could assume these costs. Um, we all know, as a practical matter, that that the government isn't going to do that because, at this point, um, the political dynamics in Washington are such that that's not going to happen. Now, that is not necessarily an objection to the point. In fact, institutionally, Congress could change the law. It's just not likely to do so. Um, the other uh, point is that uh, the requirement uh, that, that um, nonprofit uh, employers file a particular form that certifies to their objections, uh, the court says, well, the, the government could apply the same accommodation to for-profit entities, or at least for-profit closely held entities. The, the, the holding in this case is specifically focused on, on for-profit closely held corporations because that's what Hobby Lobby, Conestoga Wood Products, uh, the challengers here are. But the court says here, we do not decide today whether an approach of this type complies with RFRA for purposes of all religious objections to the contraceptive mandate. Now, in one sense, this seems like it's a kind of a prudent caution. It's sort of judicial minimalism that a lot of folks think is a good thing. Why decide an issue that isn't squarely presented? But the opinion actually recognizes that this issue is out there uh, in two separate footnotes, uh, the court refers to a pending case where the certification uh, requirement, the, the uh, validity of the certification requirement it is in question. Um, and this also may help to explain the vitriolic dissent uh, that the three female justices uh, issued three days after Hobby Lobby in the Wheaton College case. Wheaton College objects to having to complete the form. Um, now, um, uh, the, um, there are some other things to think about with respect to this case. Um, Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood Products specifically object to four of the 20 forms of contraception that the Institute of Medicine uh, listed uh, in its recommendation. Um, and the, and they, the uh, Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood Products object because they regard those, those uh, methods as, uh, as, as abortifacients. A couple of things to say about this. Number one, while Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood Products objected only to these contraceptive methods, some of the other objectors of, uh, would not accept virtually any form of artificial contraception, and presumably they would make uh, they would make a similar um, a similar sort of argument. Now, with respect to the particular uh, objection here that these these four methods are abortifacients, uh, a couple of things to say about that. Um, the generally accepted definition, medical definitions of, of, uh, of pregnancy and, uh, and abortion uh, do not regard these methods uh, of contraception as abortifacient. Um, now, um, in this sense, you might say that, that Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood Products are denying the standard medical definition of pregnancy and abortion. Um, but, but 
it's not clear how much that matters. After all, uh, the issue here is not whether the world is flat or or not. The issue is whether the employers sincerely believe that these are abortive patients. Uh, and in this sense, we, it's a, this is a little bit like the 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 issue in the VMI case. Uh, those of you who have who had me for constitutional law, remember we sp one of the questions I ask is the district court made detailed factual findings, and uh, Justice Ginsburg, who wrote the the opinion of the court in the case, never says anything to the effect that those factual findings are clearly erroneous, which is the standard for overturning factual findings. Well, the reason I think she didn't say that is because the issue wasn't whether the facts were, were accurate, it was the legal significance of the facts. And here, it seems to me that, that the legal significance of the employer's belief uh, is what matters for RIFRA purposes, not so much um, whether the employer's beliefs are consistent with standard medical practice. And note that in this case, all nine justices agreed that Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood Products, the, the, that the, uh, the owners, uh, were in fact sincerely uh, motivated. But in the end, it seems to me that, that the objections that Conestoga Wood Products, Hobby Lobby, um, and these other objectors are raising goes to the question of complicity. Um, the, what does it mean to, for the employer to be complicit in an activity or, or, or behavior by an employee uh, to which the employer has religious objections. Um, the, the, in this case, Hobby Lobby and Constable Group Products said, if we have to pay for, if we have to provide the, these contraceptive methods, we're complicit in something that we think is profoundly wrong on religious grounds. Um, now, Part of the reason the issue wound up getting framed this way in terms of health benefits is because of a quirk in our tax laws. Um, that is, um, health benefits generally are not taxable to the employee. There is a provision in the Affordable Care Act that says that certain kinds of fancy Cadillac plans now might be taxable. But in general, uh, health benefits are not, are not treated as income to the employee. Um, they want, and as I said, that's, that, that has a lot to do with how our, our uh, health benefits system has, has developed. But if we think about this more generally, if we take the tax issue out of, out of this, um, and we ask, well, the employer is paying the employee a wage or a salary. The employee then spends money on things that the employer might find objectionable. Um, the question is, at what point does the employer become complicit by virtue of having paid the money? Granted, there's a different, there, there's a possible difference between uh, the, uh, the general payment of wages or salaries on the one hand and uh, payment that is directly for health benefits. Uh, and so, uh, Although, as a matter of economic reality, there may not be a huge difference, uh, there is at least in form uh, a difference that, the, that employers might raise. But the complicity argument goes beyond money. Some of the objecting employers, like Wheaton College, like the Little Sisters of the Poor, believe that even filling out the form that the government has provided it represents complicity. And that gets to the question not of the sincerity of the religious belief, but rather with the substantiality of the burden on religious belief, uh, which uh, raises a whole set of other issues. But I, wanna, I just want to conclude by coming back to the point about employer-provided uh, health benefits. Because, um, as I said, we have this system um, because of various quirks in the tax law and, and tax uh, regulations. Um, to the extent that employers might claim that employees are using 
the money received from the employer for a religiously objectionable purposes, this raises lots more profound questions, lots more general questions about whether we ought to have an employer-based health system or have some different kind of system. I mentioned earlier that it is wildly unlikely that Congress would, uh, in fact, uh, 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 pay for contraceptive benefits. Uh, I think it is naive to believe that even if we went to a single payer system that these issues would go away because lots of people who have strenuous, sincerely held objections to abortion and, and ver at least some forms of contraception will try to reflect those positions in whatever single payer system we have. These are really hard questions. I think that the, that the Hobby Lobby decision, although it it might be legally defensible. I'm not persuaded. Um, I'm not, I don't think that we're going to see a huge uh, successful move to change the law. Um, uh, but I think that, that whether, whether I'm persuaded or not, um, it seems to me we're dealing with a much bigger set of questions than just whether the court got this case and maybe some oncoming cases right. Let me hand things off from here. Great, thanks. Um, so, I, wow, so the first two speakers touched on a lot of things, and I think it was a really comprehensive um, discussion in many ways. So what I think I want to do with my time is to bring in a perspective that I think has been um, largely lacking um, or, or not sufficiently discussed in connection with the Hobby Lobby case, which is the gender equality angle. Um, you know, I think that this case is really not about religious freedom. I think it's about gender equality. And I think, and, and cases like it, the issue in general, I guess. And I think, um, although I believe that Hobby Lobby is sincere in its, and, and others who oppose the contraception mandate are sincere in their religious beliefs, I think their religious beliefs are that women should not be taking these drugs that they consider to be abortifacients and that, um, they're going to do whatever they can to inhibit access, not that um, they are by paying for um, uh, a general health insurance plan that may include or that does include these drugs, that they are actually violating their religious beliefs. Um, so I'll say more about why I think that in a minute. I want to just say, first of all, that, um, you know, a lot of, to give a little historical context to what's going on, um, initially the entire movement for um, what's called contraceptive equity really started um, in the 1990s into the 2000s. There was a movement to force employers, private employers, to cover um, contraceptives on the same terms as they covered other preventive drugs. And there was a decision out of the EEOC around, I think it was 2000, um, in which it held that not covering contraceptives in, a, in an employer health plan in which other preventive health care was covered constituted sex discrimination under Title VII. And there were a couple of um, court decisions affirming that view. Um, there was a move at the time to get states to adopt um, laws including contraceptive coverage, requiring inclusion of contraceptive coverage that was fairly successful. A majority of states do have such laws. Um, there were um, efforts at the federal level as well, and those efforts ultimately did falter on um, uh, concerns about the, the nature and scope of religious exemptions. But um, initially the move was a move to um, uh, support women's access to contraception, and um, the opposition to that was by the kinds of um, forces you would expect to be opposed to um, women accessing contraception. It wasn't all um, just religious employers, and many of them were and continue to be exempted under state laws. Um, so, so it definitely comes out of a context of, of gender equality. I think I have a few other reasons why I think um, this case is really about um, certain employers just being ideologically, religiously opposed, ideologically and religiously opposed to women taking contraceptives or certain kinds of contraceptives and simply um, taking this stand in order to prevent access rather than to avoid their own um, what they perceive as sinfulness. I think, first of all, the strongest point, and this has been touched on by both of the previous speakers, but the complicity claim, the claim that Hobby Lobby is complicit in an abortion by providing 
um, contraceptive access in its health plans by covering these contraceptive methods is so incredibly attenuated. And I think that's really been underappreciated how far-fetched this claim of complicity really is. First of all, as Dean Enton has pointed out, um, it's hard to see the difference between paying for health insurance coverage and paying for wages that the employee can then go use to either have an abortion or buy contraception or buy plan B or whatever. So, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a separable amount of money that they're being asked to put in. Um, it is part of a, a general health plan that they have to buy. Health plans are part of compensation. Everybody knows that. They're, so they're very much like wages. They are part of your compensation in a job. Um, if you were to get rid of, if, if Case Western were to get rid of my health benefits tomorrow, they would feel like they had to pay more money to employees to attract them in the future. Um, it's not like um, a, a religious pacifist being forced to work in a munitions factory or something where, you know, you can really see the direct relationship between what you're doing and the end result. Um, this is much, much more attenuated. In addition, even if they do provide um, insurance that includes contraceptive coverage, it then takes an independent decision of the employee to use it to buy contraceptives, to take the contraceptives, to take those specific contraceptives, um, which they may or may not choose. And then, um, you know, this has been alluded to also, but there is almost no evidence that most of these forms of contraception, certainly Plan B, which is one of the ones that Hobby Lobby objected to, there's almost no scientific evidence that it actually has the effect, the post-fertilization effect that Hobby Lobby objects to. So what they object to is any drug that acts on, um, uh, that acts post-fertilization, that prevents a, per a fertilized egg from implanting. They believe that's abortion. Now, we can argue all day and all night whether that is abortion, but the, my point is that it's not even clear that it has this objected to effect. As a matter of fact, almost all the evidence indicates it doesn't. If it does, it does in only some small, undefinable, undeterminable category of percentage of, of instances of use of the drug. So, so we have to have the choice to use the, the insurance to buy the objected to drug, to take the objected to drug, to, um, to then have sex, to then, you know, in some undeterminable number of cases this is maybe going to possibly, although there's almost no evidence that it does, have some post-fertilization effect and somehow Hobby Lobby feels that it is being um, complicit in a sin in that unknown hypothetical number of cases in which that occurs. I, I really don't think this is a case where you're arguing that, well, your belief, your religious belief in transubstantiation is unreasonable and wrong, or in the nature of the world is unreasonable and, and wrong and therefore can't be sincere. I mean, I think this is like, um, to, to take the prisoner context, you know, let's say we have a prisoner who has religious objections to eating pork and the prison feeds him a hamburger and he says, you're violating my religious beliefs. And they say, no, that's a hamburger, it's beef. And the prisoner says, I, I, I believe it's pork, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. And, and again, the fact that, um, that the government has never really pressed this argument is astounding to me. Um, okay, um, and, and it also just simply breaks the notion of, uh, stretches the notion of complicity to the breaking point. I mean, if, you, if that's complicity, then anybody doing anything I object to is I'm being complicit in it if I'm not actively basically trying to prevent them from doing that. So I think it really, um, it's, I think that this, the weakness of the complicity argument in my view shows that what's really going on is an objection to, to women accessing these drugs in general and doing whatever you can. I think the fact that, you know, now that Hobby Lobby won and it's allowed to opt out, the fact that now the nonprofit organizations, as has been mentioned, like Wheaton College are saying, oh, even opting out uh, uh, violates our rights. We can't even be required to opt out. Again, I mean, we're stretching this concept of complicity as far as we possibly can. N none of the objectors to the, the contraception mandate are going to be happy until um, they get the result that, that there is just no assistance for women who want to seek access to these drugs at all. That's, that's what's really going on here. And I'm going to end, um, so, so uh, I just want to make one more remark um, to, to sort of support my point, which is, um, and this is more of a prediction, and predictions are always um, dangerous, but there is a, a moment in the Hobby Lobby decision where um, the dissent raises the possibility that employers will now start opting out to um, 
providing insurance that covers vaccines and that covers blood transfusions and other um, types of, of medical procedures that we think are important, um, medically necessary, um, but to which some discrete groups have objections. And I am going to predict, and I think that it will support my view about that this is really about, about women and sex, is that um, I will bet that if there are any of those cases, they will be extremely far, few and far between. If, and, and I'm really doubtful that we're going to see any cases of that. Because really, again, these cases are not about employers who don't want to be complicit in uh, extremely attenuated health care decisions of people whose lives they don't control. This is about employers who don't want women to have access to contraception. And, um, and, and, and that is the debate that's going to continue. And I, I'll bet we don't see anyone trying to raise the same objections about, um, or certainly very few people raising the same objections about b vaccines or um, blood transfusions in the future. So um, I'll actually stop there and leave it open. Thank you to our panelists. Yes, Sharona. What? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Oh, so <laughs> you have a question already? Okay, great. So, so now is the portion uh, where we will ask questions. I don't have a microphone, and I actually don't want to walk around to each person. So, I'm just going to ask that if you stand up and speak very clearly. Once I've acknowledged you, uh, then we'll do the question and answer period. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, and I did see your hand, Sharona. Check two. So, for purposes of, well, of clarification. What if we had a case where an employer said, I do not believe in hiring women because I don't think men and women should be in the same workplace because it will lead to men having impure thoughts. <clears throat> wow. And there are religions that oppose mixing men and women. Under, after this decision, would an employer be able to prevail in that argument? I'll start. I think the answer would be they'd be allowed to make the claim, um, but I think they'd lose. I think they'd lose because um, the rationale of non-discrimination law, non non laws is that they have to be universal in order to be effective. Um, and so therefore there is a, in, for, so far as preventing discrimination is a compelling interest, ensuring the univer universality of the requirement is also part of the government's interest. And so I think the court would apply uh, the same test and it would say, you can bring that claim, and it's sincere, and you're just like the guy that said uh, in a case called Lee that he, he shouldn't have to pay taxes, because that viol violated his religion, that, that under the tr fairly traditional test, um, you lose. Now, if we had um, uh, non-discrimination laws that were, uh, uh, had the same degree of the sorts of exceptions that um, uh, we have in this case, then it would be closer, um, because then the government would have a hard, harder time claiming that the universality of the requirement is actually part of the government's interest. But the way the employment discrimination laws uh, work today, and, and given that the exceptions uh, are, are you know, quite narrow and I think can be reconciled with the government's characterization of its own interest, I think it would be very hard to win um, in, in that sort of case. And even something like vaccines, if it were the case that, if it weren't already the case that the vast majority of states already allow religious exceptions to vaccine requirements for school, which you know, personally I think is close to nuts, but something like 46 states or something do that, um, then I think the same sort of thing, because with vaccines you have things like herd immunity and the like, which require it to be broadly applicable and which make exceptions, um, uh, which result in exceptions actually undermining the stated governmental interest. Um, but the interesting thing there is we actually, throughout the vast majority of the country, already exempt folks for pretty much whatever reason they want. So, so I, I just want to add to that. I agree that basically um, the, the claim would be cognizable and that it would probably be a loser. Um, but I think that it would require it would require the government to say in that case, is there, is there a compelling government interest in gender equality in the workplace? I like to think that actually in that case the court would say yes, um, even though they don't recognize it here for and, and for explicitly for various reasons. But um, you know, I do want to point out that they do exempt uh, certain entities and from sex discrimination laws too, and particularly um, churches. So there, it's not that there aren't um, religious exemptions from sex, uh, sex uh, gender equality laws. There are actually so, just as there are here. While we're getting the next, I'll say the overflow. 
while Professor Harley is getting to the, the, the next uh, questioner, I'll just add, the court will almost certainly have to answer this compelling interest question. Uh, and the reason for that is what will happen is, is, is eventually the government will, has, will modify the form, trying to accommodate the Little Sisters of the Poor, Meeting College, and so on. Um, but the government's going to say, we need some form because the only way we can ensure access to contraception is, is at, we at least the government have to know that you and an employer are not fulfilling your requirement. Um, and uh, so you at least have to give a form to us. Some subset of the religious objectors will say, no, we can't sign any form at all. Um, it's going to be, the government will have, a, I think, a good argument there that, no, sorry, asking you to tell us that you're not complying, that's about as least restrictive as we can get. And that's a very strong argument. And so then the only argument left for the objector in that, in that context is to say there's no compelling interest. And so unless all of the objectors go away, uh, which isn't going to happen, um, uh, some of them will, but they won't all go away, um, that, that some courts are going to have to answer the, the underlying compelling interest question because that will be the only way objectors can, can um, try and defeat any accommodation whatsoever. Um, so forgive me if I'm being slightly repetitive, but one of my big questions coming out of this case was what is the court's role in determining the sincerity of the beliefs? So for example, with Hobby Lobby, two out of three of the contraceptives were actually covered until the mandate, and then they chose to use this as an issue of religious rights. But to my viewpoint, it didn't seem like it was a sincere religious belief because it was not something that they were practicing until it became a political issue. So my question is, does the court have a role in determining whether this belief is, in fact, a sincerely religious belief? If it's raised. I mean, the government didn't raise it, and there are a couple reasons we can, we can think that they didn't. The Greens said they didn't know. They hadn't actually looked at the, those de details of the plan in terms of what was covered and what wasn't. They didn't know about those two. And that's plausible. Um, I mean, anyone that's ever dealt with insurance from an employer standpoint, there are things you focus on in, in, in the policies and the things you don't. Um, and, but I think for the government standpoint is, okay, fine, you make, you make the Greens go away. But there were so many claims filed, the government knew it was going, there would eventually, you know, the Little Sisters of the Poor, they would have a hard time making that argument. Because the Little Sisters of the Poor were going to say, you know, it's not four, we object to all of them. And it's pretty clear what Catholic teaching is. And whether you like Catholic teaching or not, hard to argue they're being inconsistent with it. So, you know, did the government just say, okay, we're going to lose in challenging that? Or did they say, Hobby Lobby's a really big company, and we'd rather get them in front of the Supreme Court than, say, there's this one other group that challenged it. There's this construction company in Indiana that's actually owned by nuns. It's technically a for-profit construction company, but all the profits are then used to pay for their, their missionary work and their, and, their, and their social service work. But legally, it's a for-profit entity, right? Talking to some of the attorneys involved in this litigation, that's the case the plaintiffs wanted, right? You know, that we want nuns that own a construction company. The government, <laughs> for understandable reasons, may have just said, we want a really big corporation because that will m make the court the least worried about what happens if big corporations can claim these types of exemptions. So I mean, there may have been some, strate some strategy involved, but the government has to raise it. And we know in the prison context, if you're a prisoner, and under either equivalent state law or under RELUPA, you say, um, you know, my religion requires that I get steak three days a week. You know, they're going to they're gonna call BS on you. And, and, and now maybe some prisoners are going to be able to show that, in fact, there is a religion that they've been adhering to for a long time that really does require that. Um, but we see in the prison context that, that you know, you, we can raise those sorts of claims, and, and courts will look We'll, we'll examine them if they are asked to. The government never raised that here, just like it never raised the, the claim that, that uh, these four substances were, could operate post-fertilization was true or not. And one reason they didn't is perhaps because you go to the FDA website, the FDA website still says that they can. It's not clear that reflects current scientific understanding, but it would have been kind of hard for the government to say, well, the information the FDA, FDA provides to the public on their website is wrong. Um, you know, so. There are strategic considerations in terms of what issues get raised and don't. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that generally courts are hesitant outside of the prisoner context to really question sincerity of religious beliefs. But I also think the point that you raised goes to the substantiality of the burden, too. I mean, if they never cared enough to look at their own health insurance plan before, you know, and now they're claiming that this is just putting them to this horrible Hobbesian, you know, dilemma between following their religious beliefs and, and you know, 
denying uh, health coverage altogether, um, you know, is again strikes me as is that it should have been raised as an aspect of substantial burden. But I don't think the court dealt with substantial burden very thoroughly here. Really and, and, let, and let me just let me just emphasize that that. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it might be easier in cases like this for the government not to question the sincerity of the, of the belief and to get more into the substantiality of the burden because under RIFRA, the trigger is that whatever the government is doing to which somebody objects, it has to impose a substantial burden on, on the exercise of religion. Uh, and at least, in, and that's why I think the complicity uh, point here about what's going on really matters. Mm -hmm. yeah, one thing, like, it's a really tough issue. I mean, the, 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 the professor is absolutely right uh, that the majority doesn't really deal with what substantial and substantial burden means. And there really isn't much out there that really tells us what that is in this context. There are other contexts where the court's been willing to define what could be a substantial burden, but not here. And I think it's because it's really difficult for some of the same reasons that the court tried to get out of these questions in Employment Division versus Smith. That is, to say something is a substantial burden to the practice of free exercise requires thinking about the degree of burden on the religious adherent, which means how important is this burden on them within their worldview? So, you know, for an outsider to say, well, signing a form is not a big deal, well, maybe there's a religion that where one, one signs one's name and one takes a sacred oath, that's like the biggest part of the religion, most central part of the religion. And the rest of us might go, well, that's kind of silly. We sign things all the time that we don't even read. I mean, that, what, but, but that's not any of the cases sure, that we're no, dealing with here. Agreed. I, I, I just think, I think, I think that, that trying to figure out what substantial means in this context is, is necessarily in tension with, with the court's claim that it's not going to look inside the, the underlying logic of the religious beliefs. And again, I think, I think that's part of what the Supreme Court tried to get itself out of in the Employment Division versus Smith case. And at least in my view, it's what Congress threw the Supreme Court back into by enacting RIFRA, because it's really hard to get out of these tough questions. We have a question here, and I saw another one there. If you have a question, I'll just ask you. Um, so if people who are currently working for Hobby Lobby and other SIP corporations with uteruses are taking birth control for non-reproductive reasons, can companies like Hobby Lobby still deny access to them? And if so, like what about medications that have side effects of things like miscarriages? Should these also be like able, should Hobby Lobby be able to say that they don't want to provide these? Well, so I, I mean, I actually, I, so I, Hobby Lobby, I don't think that's going to be relevant to them specifically because I don't know that they're, ta you know, that any of those forms. So I, actually, I think that the answer is we don't know. I mean, that's that's another case. Again, if a, an employer wants to deny access to contraception or coverage of contraception and somebody wants to take it for health reasons and they still say it's against their religion to do that, to permit that, I, I think that's, you know, I, I don't think Hobby Lobby gives us the answer. Yeah, you agree? I'll say, I mean, a lot of the hypotheticals that come out of this for perhaps just due to sheer luck don't actually seem to arise because there aren't religions out there that claim these things. So, for example, blood transfusions. There are religions that object to blood transfusions. None of those religions believe, though, that, it, that one is morally complicit and therefore sinful if one in some way facilitates a non-adherent from obtaining a blood, blood transfusion. Now, when, if some religion arises, you know, that, that makes that claim, well, then we have to face that. But, but right now, at least, we don't have that. Um, the Catholic Church, for example, does not prohibit the use of, of drugs that can act as contraceptives for non-contraceptive purposes. Uh, and, and so if a woman has a medical condition um, that requires uh, the use of one of these drugs for that purpose, Right, the Catholic Church doesn't say you can't, you, you can't get it, and so it can be covered under those plans. So we haven't had to confront these questions. Um, I think the logic of, Hob I mean, the argument that was made during Hobby Lobby all the time was it's just these four medications. It was true for Hobby Lobby, but legally irrelevant. Right? The, the Hobby Lobby's claim, as accepted, it doesn't matter if it was four of 14, two of 14, all 14. And so I think the logic of that is if they said, you know, we don't want to cover aspirin, Aspirin's not covered anyway. Uh, you know, we don't want to cover, um, 
we don't want to cover you know uh, some other drug. Uh, you know we don't want to cover um, uh, sleep aids like Ambien because we think medically assisted sleep you know interferes with the, the communal with God or something. I don't know. Uh, bar blocks revelation. Um, yeah, they could probably make that claim. Um, and and but yeah. you know, and Congress could could change that. I, mean, I think the logic of the opinion is reaches farther than, oh, it's just four out of whatever. I, I, right. I think that's right. I, I just also want to add that, like, to, to put another perspective on that question, though, I mean, so what's actually going to happen now if there is a Catholic employer who is now not providing insurance who ha for contraception who has an employee that needs these drugs for medical reasons unless you know they have a mechanism for accessing that what's going to happen is now the onus is going to be on the employee to say to their Catholic boss, um, Father, I need <laughs> contraception, right, for um, medical reasons. Could you please let me know how to make that happen through my health insurance plan? Which is a very different scenario from, you know, what Hobby Lobby is, where um, if the default is the baseline is everybody covers it, um, then then that person's in a very different position. So it's already shifted the landscape somewhat because now people don't have why to cover it, and the onus is on the employee. Why doesn't the plan just cover it based on the 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 prescription code or the the um, diagnosis code that the that the doctor I don't know gives. That they, I mean, they don't usually do that. I mean, I know. I mean, just think about one example. To what extent do you think the decision is um, and the plaintiff's main purpose is to cause Obamacare to fail? Because part of what they're doing is increasing expense and this uh, Obamacare was supposed to create administrative efficiency but now insurance companies instead of offering one basic plan are going to have to exclude these drugs for that person and those for some for another employer and the government's going to have to have an office to process claims and the insurance company is going to have people to determine whether um, the, whether the contraceptive pill is being used for contraceptive purposes or for some other medical reason. It seems like that to a great extent, the force behind all of this is to make Obamacare fail. Well, let me say, I think that there are people out there, I don't know, that I have no reason to think that that's what has driven um, Hobby Lobby or Conestoga Wood Products or most of the other objectors. But I think it is pretty clear that there are people out there who are looking for every potential legal challenge to, to this program. Um, whether undermining the contraceptive mandate would, would go very far toward making the whole program fail, I think is, uh, yeah. I'm skeptical that it, that it would have a significant impact. But I do think that there are people out there who are looking for every conceivable legal argument that might ultimately uh, cause the program to fail. And uh, I think that, that I'm not a political uh, prognosticator or anything like that, but uh, I think that, that if the Republicans gain control of the Senate, uh, this year that there will be even bigger congressional battles uh, about how the program uh, is, is administered and implemented, uh, but we already have a lot of those. Hi, uh, I wanted to go back to the compelling interest uh, test. So earlier you said the court might be uh, asked to confront whether or not the government does in fact have a compelling interest in uh, the providing access to contraception. And I just want to know, as a general matter, how deferential have the courts been on compelling, in, when the government asserts that they have a compelling interest and it's either an uh, or for, or for a claim or some other uh, strict scrutiny uh, issue, how deferential are the courts to the, when the government asserts a compelling interest? Do you want to take that? Yeah. To take it? I mean, we only have one other Supreme Court RFRA claim. Um, uh, it was a unanimous decision called Ocentro, I forget the full name of the case, uh, involving the claim of a church 
that um, used a hallucinogenic tea that is prohibited both under federal law and under international treaty. And the court said that um, they had to be allowed to get their, um, their hallucinogenic tea, even though it's illegal under federal law, even though the, the federal government had treaty obligations. Uh, and the court made fairly quick work of those claims, 9-0. Um, um, so um, that's to say that, that you know, the court seems to have taken Congress's met language as, as being very aggressive. But we don't have a lot of data points. And it's not clear that compelling interest in this context will mean the same thing that it means in other contexts, like suspect classifications and the like. Yeah, I, I think it, it really depends on the context. I'll also note that in the case that uh, Professor Adler alluded to that's before the Supreme Court this term, the prisoner beard case, um, that's one of the issues. Um, uh, that's being raised because there is a circuit split in specifically in the prison context on how deferential the courts have to be to the government's asserted interests. So um, at least there we may get some clarification and maybe you know beyond that what what Lupo really means that that statute really means when it says compelling interests. Um, looking at uh, health benefits as sort of the compensatory nature for employees. Um, in the case that there's a more shift to uh, HSAs as the health um, care uh, funder, um, would employers be able to restrict employees' use of HSA funds using Hobby Lab? I don't think so. I think part of the, the argument of complicity is based on the fact that the insurer is the, the, the employer is, well, in some cases, the employer and the insurer are the same for self insuring entities, but because legally the employer is the contracting party for the insurance contract and the employer then has the ownership stake, whereas with an HSA typically we say it's, it's it, the, the employee has the underlying ownership interest and so the employer no longer has a, a say in how that's used. Um, so I think it'd be hard. Someone will try, no well, doubt. Well, and <laughs> let, let's be clear that it's not like there's a big distinction between H or a, 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 a bright line between HSAs and health benefits. In fact, a lot of people use at least some of the money in their HSA to, to pick up uh, expenses that, that, uh, that they're obligated for under, um, under the, the company, the employer's provided insurance. The, the thing is that in this setting, it's unlikely to arise because if the contraceptive, you know, the contraceptive mandate says that this that these uh, the contraception are supposed to be available at no cost to the employee, so it's not clear where the employee is going to be using the HSA funds. Okay, so it's a little after one o'clock. There's not a class here, so I let it go a little bit longer. But thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs>